Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. I am, as always, your teacher, your mentor, your, I don't know, clan lord, <laughs> Nicholas Dyson. Um, before I get into today's shift to the Kamakura Jidai, the Kamakura period, um, I wanted to just note that, so like, okay, guys, if you have questions about the readings or about like the you know the assignments or really anything just email me i'll i'm more than happy to respond in fact it doesn't even need to be something like sort of specifically dire of like you just have a general question about some like topic that i don't cover or just something that you want to ask me about japanese literature or japanese culture just do so i'm more than happy to answer i mean you're you're paying me so feel free to do so um also like feel free to especially to email me questions about the assignments before you do them. Um, it's always better to like, if you're confused, ask the question first and then I can help you out and then do the assignment rather than do the assignment in a confused state and then wonder what you should have done afterwards. See how that makes sense? I think that's just generally a better approach. Okay, so <clears throat> today we are going to be shifting gears quite a lot. So the so the shift from the the Heian period to the um, the Kamakura period is in many ways analogous to the shift from sort of like the the period in Japanese history prior to the introduction of Buddhism to the period afterwards. It's really that drastic of a change, and the reason why I brought up the whole issue of like if you guys want to email me questions about you know the course content do so because one of you actually like asked you know a really interesting question and it brought out something that I realized that I hadn't emphasized enough which is that so Buddhism in the Heian period is extremely different from Buddhism as basically understood from the Kamakura period on um, so the reason why I emphasize like esoteric Buddhism and I didn't talk about any of the other strains of Buddhism is precisely for this reason, because in this period, like a lot of the, the you're going to see a lot of continuity, but also like the things that are brought like the earlier like literature and the earlier sort of like the political culture and also just like the religious culture that is all that is all going to be transmitted into what is typically known as the medieval period in Japanese history or the feudal period. But it's going to be wildly reinterpreted. It's a very, very different thing because, and this is sort of a theme of this course. I had noted this at the beginning, but I want to reiterate it at this point. Like, Japanese culture is not a unified thing. It changes drastically over time. Now, oftentimes you wouldn't know this from a lot of Japanese cultural critics themselves who are very, like, politically invested in this notion that Japanese culture and Japanese history is this one sort of universal transcendent thing. It's not. It's really not. And one of the sort of points of this course is to show you in precise detail exactly how it is not. So the first thing I want to talk about today is sort of the major event that precipitated this shift from this sort of like lackadaisical, hey, let's just all hang out and like write poems about cherry blossoms culture of the Heian period to the warrior culture that really comes to dominate from the Kamakura period on. And so the major precipitating event for this is what is known as the, the Genpei War. And you see that I have Genpei Kassen there. Um, this is a war that lasted from roughly 1180 to 1185, but you have to actually understand it as like the third in a series of civil wars. Or rather, okay, no, it's preceded by two sort of rebellions, sort of brief rebellions. And then as a result of sort of the fallout of those two rebellions and the political strife that sort of was, that was sort of latent within them, this then led into this massive civil war that you know, took place over the course of about six, well, five and a half to six years. And the first of these, and this all occurred in a span of less than 30 years. So you have three major civil uprisings that complete, like, so prior to this, you have several hundred years of pretty much nothing happening. <laughs> and then at the end of that, like, you know, several hundred year period, all of a sudden within the span of three decades, you have three major civil wars. That's pretty crazy. So the first of these is known as the, the Holgen Rebellion. Um, 
and there's a there's a subtle change that occurs. So in the Heian period, I talked a lot about how this family, the the Fujiwara, were sort of the powers behind the throne. They would often marry uh, Fujiwara patriarchs would often marry their daughters. I'm gonna flip these up because they're squeaking a lot. Would often marry their daughters into the imperial line of succession. And as a result, kind of become, as I said, powers behind the throne. Um, but there, but as a result of this dominance, strangely enough, there was often like political strife within the Fujiwara family itself. So you would often have like branches of the Fujiwara clan who were sort of vying to become the major one, to become the one that was actually in control of political affairs. And so this strife broke out into a, a complicated succession issue that I don't want to get into the details of. The important point is that the two sort of warring factions in this internal like conflict within the Fujiwara clan were supported by these two clans, the, the Taira and the Minamoto. And the Taira and the Minamoto are really going to be the ones that come to the fore in the Genpei War itself. But this is sort of how they first get involved in sort of like the political infighting. And so you have members of each of these clans supporting so so in this case it's sort of the, the, the you have the fujiwara sort of who are in the foreground you know fighting with each other and then they're being supported by the taira and the minamoto respectively now in 11 and so this moment in time is actually sort of the beginning of the ascendancy of the Taira clan. It was the it was the it was the Fujiwara faction supported by the Taira that sort of like regained control over the situation. And as a result of the Taira's support of that faction, they too grew in prominence. This then led to what is now known as the Heiji Rebellion in 1160. So only you know four years later. Now, this actually sort of then inverts it, whereas before you had the Fujiwara who were at the forefront and they're being supported by the Taira and the Minamoto. Now you actually have an open conflict between the Taira and the Minamoto, and then they, like the pretext that they use to justify that conflict is to sort of resolution of the power struggle within the Fujiwara clan. So the Fujiwara are now secondary to the Taira and the Minamoto. Now, the Minamoto fail in their attempt to sort of like displace the, the rising Taira clan. And for a brief time, the Taira clan itself has actually supplanted the Fujiwara as that sort of like latent power behind the throne. Now, something that's really important to note about these two clans is that they're very unusual. These aren't actually, unlike most like Japanese clans, these are not really ancient families. They're not like the, the Kiyawara, they're not like um, the Fujiwara, they're, they're, they're not, they don't have like an ancestral home, they don't have like a base of power from which they later have bases of power that they sort of acquire, but there's not like a historical family from which they're descended. These two clans are actually made up of imperial descendants who are made commoners. Now we saw an example of this in the tale of Genji. So Genji himself was the son of an emperor and he was literally made a commoner and he was inserted into this family, the Minamoto. In fact, his name Genji literally means, as as I noted back then, Mr. Minamoto. <laughs> or like, or in fact, this this term Genji later comes to refer to the Minamoto clan itself. They are sometimes called the Genji in the same way that the Taira clan is sometimes called the Heika, thus Heika Monogatari. Now, why is this important? So they're sort of artificial families, and they're constantly being added to. Like there, so it's not just that like you have like at one point, you know, a number was like, okay, I got to get rid of a bunch of these kids that I have. And so I'm going to create a new family and they're now dumped into this family. And then you know, their descendants, et cetera, et cetera. So no, it's constantly being sort of reinvigorated with imperial blood. Um, and an example of this, I'm going to go skip down a little bit, is this guy here who is a major player in the Genpei War, Taira no Kiyomori. Um, Kiyomori was actually the son of an emperor. Literally, um, he like emperors as as we as we as we noticed like to have fun time, fun sexy times with lots and lots of women. So they had lots of kids. Um, Kiyomori was the descendant of the emperor Shirakawa and just some random like consort in his in his court. The woman was not terribly prominent, and so as a result, um, Kiyomori was then given to um, another member of the Taira clan. 
Tadamori as his adopted son. Now, what's interesting, so the reason why this is important to note, this way in which sort of like Kiyomori has been like transmitted to the Taira clan, is that you have these two noble clans whose members like have a sense of where it is that they came from. In other words, it's not just that they're sort of like risen, risen, risen to power. In many ways, they're sort of seen, they have, there's a sense that they're like fallen, that they've sort of like were part of the imperial family and then were removed from it. And so their political machinations are in many ways an attempt to try and like regain that status that was taken away from them. Now, um, Kiyomori in particular was not a terribly fun dude. <laughs> I mean, okay, another theme of this course is that um, Japanese warriors are rarely honorable. Yeah, that's it. They're, rare, they're rarely very honorable. Um, the dude was, he was a jerk. He's an asshole. Um, <laughs> and in this capacity as a total bastard, um, literally actually a bastard, <laughs> now that I think about it, <laughs> um, in um, 1180, um, as part of a power play, he actually tried to remove all of his rivals, including many um, members in the Minamoto clan, from various government posts. And this is what directly precipitated the, the onset of the Genpei War. Then the Minamoto were not happy with this, and so they decided to fight back. Now, on the, the Minamoto side of the equation, we really want to talk about two dudes. Um, Yoshitsune and Yoritomo. Yoritomo is the guy who will eventually become the first shogun. Well, okay, not the first shogun. Shogun, again, this is a term that's changed. He's the first person to come what we now think of as a shogun, like as, as essentially a military dictator. Um, and then his younger brother, Yoshitsune. So now what's interesting is that in the dynamic between these two, um, Yoritomo is, you know, he's, he's okay as a warrior, but he's really more sort of like, the he's more politically devious whereas yoshitsune was sort of the like sort of classic idea of a warrior he was a brilliant military commander but politically he was kind of dumb and so as a result um it's interesting because yoritomo in um especially in like later years he he becomes one of like japanese history's great villains because of his his epic betrayal of and exile of his brother yoshitsune yoshitsune then in this sort of way of seeing things becomes like the he's the the virtuous brother and yoritomo is the evil schemer there's this interesting thing that you see in um japanese literary history especially japanese literature that like deals with history is the way in which the losers tend to be valorized like the winners tend to be <laughs> tend to be villains, and the losers tend to be like the great tragic heroes. This is sort of the way this is a pattern that actually the literature of this period establishes and sort of keeps getting repeated over and over and over again. Which is why, as I noted here, um, sorry, my notifications. Um, both Kimori and Yoshitsune are often considered to be tragic heroes, despite the fact that, as we see, as you actually see in your reading from the Heika Monogatari for for, today, for this week, um, Kimori is not a particularly great guy, um, and neither is Yoshitsune for for that matter. But um, this is sort of a way in which their lives are reinterpreted by the literature of the period. So. <clears throat> with the defeat of the the Taira in 1185, at the um, well. At the Battle of Danura, but then also like the mopping up afterwards. So at that point, the emperor handed most administrative power over to Yoritomo because Yoritomo had acted on his behalf. Now, here's an interesting thing to note. And so this is something I want to establish right away. So also the shogunates, the, the, the success of shogunates that we'll see are very different from each other. They're not really similar things. So in this first Kamakura shogunate, under Yoritomo, the justification for Yoritomo having this degree of authority over the political affairs of the country is based very much in the fact that the Minamoto clan is itself descended from the imperial line. In other words, it's not inappropriate for them to have this degree of political control precisely because the members of this clan have this basis in the, like, the imperial household. That's the justification anyway. Whether or not you agree with that is, you know, it's your opinion, man. But the other thing to note about Yoritomo is that his actual base of political power is in the East. So actually, maybe something I should do is bring up a map of Japan. 
Map. Let's look at the map. Map. Google. Google Maps. Let's do Google Maps. You guys don't get to see where I live. Well, I live in Iowa City. Okay, now you know. All right. So let's see here. Let's bring over Japan. Okay. So Kyoto, or Heian Kyo, as it was known then, so the, the, the capital, is right here. Whereas Kamakura, let's see if I can zoom in far enough. It's coming up. It's near Yokohama. Where are you, Kamakura? Anyway, it's near Yokohama. It's over here. So, well, I, actually, in many ways, that, that that's not even the point. So the, the point is that sort of as Yoritomo's base of power is over here in the east. So you see this area here. This is the, the Kanto or the Kanto Plain. Whereas the sort of the older aristocratic nobility come from over here in the west. And so this is the with the the shift from um, power being centered in like in Kyoto in the imperial court to um, power now being actual political power being centered in in the east. This is sort of the beginning of a classic like clash that you see throughout Japanese feudal society where there's this sort of back and forth between the two. Like there would be periods of unrest where one is trying to wrest control back from the other, re restoring the emperor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the origin of this sort of dichotomy, this sort of like political, this bipolar political situation that pretty much remains the case in Japan what basically until the modern period. And so that's a thing to sort of keep in mind as we look at this. So why do I bring all of this up? So the whole point of, of mentioning that like there's this extreme political turmoil, everything has been completely upended, like the way in which society had been running for hundreds of years is now fundamentally changed is because we see also a fundamental shift in the way in which various cultural institutions understand themselves. And nothing embodies the shift better than in sort of the, the switch over from the ascendancy of esoteric Buddhism in the Heian period to what is called Pure Land or Jodo or Jodo, sorry, um, Buddhism in, from essentially the 12th, the late 12th, early 13th century onwards. Um, <clears throat> and with that, like all of the sort of the Buddhist elements are there. And in fact, in many ways, and this is sort of a weird thing, like... <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll, I'll point this out now. I was going to point it out later, but I'll talk about it now. So Pure Land Buddhism is actually much older than esotericism. So if you think about sort of like the way in which these things get transmitted, often sort of like there's this like west to east transmission that occurs. So you have like the way in which particular Buddhist practices develop in like what is now northern India, parts of Nepal, like sort of anyway, the, the Indian subcontinent. And the way that gets transmitted into China and then from China gets sort of like disseminated out to various other East Asian countries. Now, what's weird about this is how in China, like Pure Land Buddhism is actually is, is, is the older of, of the sort of like religious schools, so to speak. Um, esotericism doesn't really as we as I noted, it doesn't really sort of become a thing until around the time actually that Kukai first went to China to study. Um, Pure Land Buddhism is at least as old as like the fifth century. In fact, I think the very early fifth century, like 402, 403, something like that. So Pure Landism, for lack of a better term, is much older. But in Japan, it's different. And so this is this is where it becomes complicated. You can't think of like Buddhism in general terms. Like Buddhism in Japan, as I've noted before, is a weird thing. It's a different thing. And so Pure Land, as it's understood in Japan, actually evolves out of esoteric Buddhism. Even though like in the rest of Asia, it's kind of the other way around. <laughs> like, it's very weird. Um, and so as a result, you have a very different understanding of this notion of uh, the so-called matpol or the, the decline of the Dharma, where in the Heian period, this was understood as kind of, it was sort of like a general malaise. It's sort of like, it's like a sort of slow decline, but there's nothing especially dire about it. It's just sort of like, oh, everything, every, you know, things used to be so much better, but nowadays everything's just kind of, hmm. 
and that's it. Like the, there's nothing, there's no doom and gloom attached to it. Whereas from the Kamakura period onward, because of like the extreme political unrest that marked the transition from the Heian period to the Kamakura period, the, the, the this concept of the decline of the Dharma takes on really, really dire consequences. Like it's total doom and gloom. It's the world is falling apart. It's, it's not just everything's kind of slowly getting in. It's like the world is falling apart. Everything is coming, society is coming apart at the seams. What are we going to do? No one's coming to save us. How are we going to fix this? And so in this world of complete unrest, and not just in, in a world of unrest, but a world in which they actually have like historical memory, like there are literary texts, there are ways to know what it used to be like. And that memory is still rough, still pretty fresh in people's minds. So as a result, there is actually a turn towards trying to find salvation in a higher power. So a little bit about Pure Land as it's sort of the concept of the Pure Land, where it comes from. It actually originated from this, this notion in very early, like, Buddhist reception that the like the specific spot, the area in which the, the Buddha himself was present was especially sanctified. Like that that like by merely being there, the Buddha made that spot, that place, a holy place. That's all it really meant. That's all so literally purifying that spot of land. That's all it meant. Now, as these as sort of pure land ideas were transmitted into China. And so it's really in China where like Pure Landism is like a doctrine gets developed. As it gets transmitted into China, this idea of sort of like this specific like sanctified spot starts to evolve into a, an actual like paradise that is located somewhere in the West, a Pure Land in the West, a, a beautiful paradise where after we die, we will be reborn with the Buddha and everything will be super happy fun or better, I guess. So you see how this is sort of like, maybe you see how this is kind of like fitting better with the times where the, the this sort of provides a solution to a problem that sort of like the Japanese like collective psyche at the time can't really deal well with. Like if, if worldly affairs themselves can't solve anything, can't actually provide the relief and the solution to people's problems, the only solution that's left is this idea of sort of this, this supernatural solution to it. And so what's interesting is that there becomes a gr less focus on sort of like the kind of like cosmic Buddha, like, like Vairokana and um, the so-called Rushana Buddha. Um, there's much more of an emphasis on what is called the Amida Buddha or Amitabha, um, who interestingly enough becomes a kind of figure of devotion, very similar. I mean, the best analogy that I can think of is the way in which sort of like Jesus Christ is understood in Christianity, where like literally it is a it is a actual divine figure you pray to for salvation. In esoteric Buddhism, this that that idea, the idea that you would pray to the Buddha to save you, would be ridiculous. Would be actually absurd. It doesn't just doesn't it doesn't calculate really as far as they're concerned. But this is what is going to become, in fact, it's not just going to become the ascendant form of Buddhism, it is going to become essentially what most Buddhism in Japan is now. So, you know, particularly when it comes to like reception of Japanese Buddhism in the West, there's a lot of focus on Zen, like especially like white people, people like people like this guy, are really sort of fascinated with Japanese Zen Buddhism. Japanese Zen Buddhism is, it's a major thing, but it's not actually the thing. Like most Buddhist temples in Japan are Pure Land, something like 60%. It's obscene. It's like, it's a lot. I mean, you and so, you know, whenever you, that's why like there are all sorts of temples all over Japan that are like, you know, yada yada kannon, because kannon is the Amida Buddha, is um, Guanyin, so is the, is the, is the Chinese pronunciation of this, actually the same characters. Um, so yeah, like this is, this is Buddhism, but it became Buddhism in Japan. It's not like it was always sort of transcendently that way. It became that way as a result of like the social and political crises that occurred as a result of the transition from the Heian periods to the Kamakura period. And so that's really important to keep that in mind. Now, central to Pure Landism 
especially in Japan. So like, and this is where I, I, I don't want to get too much into sort of pure land, generally speaking, because pure land as it manifested in Japan kind of gets rid of a lot of it. <laughs> like a, a lot of what is characteristic of pure land Buddhism in China is just not there <laughs> in pure land Buddhism in, in Japan. So central to how pure land developed in Japan is the so-called the, the Nembutsu, which is a kind of prayer. And let Nembutsu literally just means to sort of like to, to name the Buddha, to announce the name of the Buddha. That's it. And so <laughs> it's interesting. If I was trying to think about like, how would you compare like the differences between esoteric Buddhism and Pure Land Buddhism in Japan? Esoteric Buddhism is kind of like going to grad school. <laughs> there's this extent, there's this expectation that in order to be like properly Buddhified, to be properly like achieve Nirvana, to like release yourself from samsara, you need to like, you need to go to all your class, like you need to take a bunch of graduate courses, you need to do an independent study, you need to write your Buddha thesis, you need to like do your Buddha comprehensive exams, you got to like write a Buddha dissertation, and then maybe, just maybe, <laughs> you'll actually achieve this, this, this state of freedom known as nirvana. Now, what's weird is that Pure Land Buddhism is like, no, you don't have to go to grad school. In fact, you don't even have to go to college. You don't have to go to high school. You don't have to go to middle school. You don't have to go to elementary school. Probably don't even really need to go to nursery school. <laughs> so in many ways, nursery school is sort of the best analogy because Pure Landism, especially as preached by people like Honen, who I'll get to in, in a second, like literally is like, no, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You don't have to like study for the rest of your life. You don't have to do all this like self-perfection BS. All you gotta do is say, Nam mami da boots, nam mami da boots, nam mami da boots, nam mami da boots, nam mami da boots. That's the nem boots. That's the, that's the prayer. It's just literally like reciting the the name of the Amida Buddha over and over and over again. This this is the the nam here. So it, it, this in Japanese this would be written namu, but it's pronounced nam. Nam mami da boots, nam mami da boots, nam mami da boots. Just say like it's just sort of a chant. It's just a recitation, and that's it. Done. Done and done. <laughs> so you can see how this would have like a kind of appeal because for like ordinary people who don't want to go to grad school <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, wait, I, I can be saved from my crappy circumstances by just saying the name of the Amida Buddha over and over again. I'm with you, man. So how did this, but that this didn't just come out of nowhere. And so like the, this practice of reciting the name of the Amida Buddha. This exists in sort of the Chinese Pure Land tradition as well. But the reason why it came to such prominence in the Japanese manifestation of Pure Land has to do with this guy right here, Honnen. Oh, and I realized, I, oh, I had all these images of dudes. Anyway, so this guy right here, here we see him preaching to, to, to the public. And you see, and what's interesting here about this image and why I used it is that you see all sorts of people here. You see, you know, you see a blind guy with his biwa. We'll talk about that when I get to the Heika Monogatari. We see some merchants over here. We see some monks here. We see random lady. We, has, we see some court dudes. We see a dancer over here. We see some warrior dudes. We've got sort of a mendicant priest over here, some other ladies, like all different types, like all sorts of people are going to this guy, Honen, to, to hear him preach his, his new Buddha way. So who is Honen? So he was born near the end of what we now know as the Heian period. Um, and his adult life really coincides with the period of political upheaval. Um, but he spent most of his adult life as, as a monk studying esoteric Buddhism, interestingly enough, at the Tendai Monastery in Mount Hiei. Hiei is sort of the center by this point in Japanese history, it is like the center of Buddhism in the entire country. It is sort of, it is now like a sacred holy mountain. It's like a scholar monastery. It is a place where you go to study all of like the, it's, it's Buddhist grad school, you know, in Japan. It's the best Buddhist grad school in Japan. Um, so Honen is an interesting dude. He kind of disaffected, like because of the, the political circumstance, the social circumstances in which he lived, he became incre incredibly disaffected with like how unsuited the kind of Buddhism he was studying to like the world around him was. 
So like most people who get disaffected in their graduate studies, he dropped out <laughs> and he literally came down Mount Hie into, so like there's, it's almost like a, it sounds like a religious story. It's like he descended from the mountain with his new ideas and he went out amongst the people to, to preach to them literally to preach to them. And that's sort of why I picked this picture is like, he's going out amongst all the people to tell them about the new Buddha way. And what is the new Buddha way? Nimbut's baby. And so these people come to him like, well, but Honen, I mean, what about, what about Buddha grad school? What about all that stuff that they've been telling us that we need to learn? Nope. Nimbut's, just do the Nimbut's, that's all you gotta do. That's it. <laughs> and what's interesting about this, as a result of this sort of new Buddha way that he was teaching, um, he became extremely popular. And this popularity started to worry both the, the religious and the political establishment. Um, the, the monks at Mount Hie, who were very, and this is a very academic thing to do, by the way, become upset with someone else. Like someone who used to be like, one of you going on becoming very popular and being like all that stuff that those guys tell you it's, it's crap you don't have to do any of that like academics hate that <laughs> more than anything else is for for someone who who was training to be an academic to then go like oh yeah all that academic stuff is stupid so what do they do well they, they do what academics tend to do which is they make life very difficult for this person and so um the religious authority because the thing is religious like institutions in japan have a lot of political clout and because the the political authorities as well were not super fond of what um honen was doing um they actually managed to convince the emperor i can't remember which emperor it was off the top of my head anyway they convinced the emperor to exile him and his followers in 1207 and so that is the situation with Honen. But the thing is, even though the dude was exiled, the, the ideas stuck around. And so I want to look at a, a couple of these things because interestingly enough, and this goes back to the point that I was trying to make earlier about how, like, even though like Pure Land is this sort of easy Buddhism, so to speak, like it has an intellectual basis. And Honan actually wrote about the intellectual basis for what he was teaching. It wasn't just like you get rid of all. It's like you know we we don't we don't need none of them smart boys. Well, we can just do the name boots and we'll be fine. No, like it wasn't like that. Like this is still a very intellectual kind of Buddhism, but it's sort of in. This is a weird contradiction. It's like an anti-intellectual intellectual Buddhism. If you've never been an academic, you you would probably like it's it's a thing like these things happen all right so let's take a look at the sort of the reading for today page 243 i gotta go up all right okay so in this text the sort of the, the philosophy of the nembuts from honen's writings and this is from roughly the year 1212 he says it pretty much straight out and that's starting right here the path to liberation from the cycle of birth and death, so that's samsara, at the present time is none other, okay, than birth in the pure land of Amida Buddha, and I'll go back and I'll parse this in a second. And the practice for birth in the pure land is none other than the nimbuts. Although in the wide sense, there are many gates to the Buddhist path for leaving this distressing world, again, this distressing world, they can be divided by and large into two, the path to self-perfection, and the path to the pure land. Okay, now I want to go back and parse this because like, even though this is just an introductory paragraph, he's actually saying a ton here. So the path to liberation, nirvana, from the cycle of birth and death, samsara. Okay, so we, we recognize this, like this is standard Buddhist stuff. Now, here's an important phrase. You may not even notice how important this was. At the present time. So he's actually identifying a different like Buddha way as a result of contemporaneous political circumstances. Now, why is this important? It's important because esoteric Buddhism as a kind of cosmic Buddhism claims to be transcendent. In other words, it's not historically specific. It's not about reacting to the present time. It's about going off into a monastery in the middle of nowhere and removing yourself from the world. Whereas this is a, a way of understanding Buddhism that is in the world, in time, in history. 
So in the present time is none other, so nothing else. Like the only thing that is appropriate for this time is birth in the pure land of Amida Buddha. Pure land Buddhism, baby. It's real, it's new, it's different, it's awesome. And the only way to get to that pure land is none other than the Nimbuts. And so he kind but then he but then he kind of hedges his bets. He's like, although in the broader sense, there are many gates to the Buddhist path. There's a bunch of different ways to do it, and this is just one of them. For leaving this distressing world, again, the emphasis on sort of like how crappy things are, they can be divided by a large into two paths. The first path being the esoteric one, what he calls the path to self-perfection. And the other, this new one, not new one, but the newly sort of ascendant one, the path to the pure land. So <clears throat> now the reason why I wanted to highlight this passage is because what's interesting about it is that there's actually kind of a logical extension of something that's key to esoteric Buddhism. And this is not indicative of how Pure Land Buddhism developed in China and then from sort of earlier Indian practices. And that is sort of, you can see in the way in which Honen understands Pure Land Buddhism has that kind of sense of the Buddha nature. And so what was the, if, if you don't recall, the Buddha nature was this idea that like it is possible for anyone in this life to achieve release from samsara, to achieve nirvana. Now, the difference is that in esoteric Buddhism, this is more of a theoretical idea. Like, theoretically, it is possible for anyone to achieve this sort of release from the cycle of life and death, but you're not likely to do it. Whereas with the, the sort of the focus on um, the Nembutsu and this sort of this very limited understanding of Pure Land Buddhism is that it's gone from like, Nirvana is theoretically available to sell, like real salvation is available to all of you now, to everyone now. <clears throat> and okay, I, this is where I had originally planned on talking about this sort of like distinction between like Pure Land Buddhism generally, but you're seeing how like there are connections here to like the way in which esoteric Buddhism was practiced in Japan and the way in which Pure Land Buddhism was developed. They're not purely distinct things in the same way that Honen is sort of studying esoteric Buddhism and reacting to it, the way in which Pure Land Buddhism developed in Japan, even beyond Honen, like is itself evolved from and reacting to esoteric Buddhist practices as they existed in Japan at the time. And the idea is that for the vast majority of people, the, the sort of the pure land formulation is a preferable one, precisely because not everybody wants to go to grad school. Now, um, in the, 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 the second piece that from, from, oops, from Honen that I had you guys read today, where's the, let's see, I need to go back to my notes real quick. It's 245, 246, okay. All right, so there is, uh, okay, it's near the bottom here. I wanna start right about here. Do you think the Buddha would look favorably on something so, uh, okay, some hold to the view, so I'm actually gonna start here. Some hold to the view that it would be something special to add certain performative activities. And this performative activities refers back to esoteric practices. Because one of the things that I noted when I talked about it before is the fact that esoteric Buddhism has a lot of um, like ritualistic practices. Ritual is very important in, in esoteric Buddhism. So Honen is addressing an implicit criticism. He's like, well, what would be the problem with adding these ritualistic practices to the sort of practice of the Nimbuts. Because such practices will assist in attaining birth and will not do anything to prevent it. This calls for clarification. Do you think the Buddha would look favorably on something so wrong and encourage people to pursue it? However much they are advised to stop, ordinary people, ordinary people, important point there, ordinary people, are drawn into the confusion of these times and pursue wrong practices only to find that they lack the strength for it. 
Yet even then the Buddha's compassion is overflowing and he will not abandon them. Those people who do wrong things such as pursuing other forms of practices in addition to Nembuts will not have the power to succeed. As for those who often read sutras and note that their wrong behavior is in line with what they find before, so what they find there, insisting that they do not suffer any ill effects because of their actions, no matter how many times you speak to them, nothing will change. The whole point, so this is actually something interesting here. So that even though Honen would say like, okay, so there's, there's this esoteric way and there's this pure land way, don't mix. Don't cross the streams. There is, the esoteric path is a path. It is a complete way. The pure land path is, is also a complete way. And the way he sort of describes the distinction in the, the, the earlier piece that I had you guys read. Um, yeah, right here. It has been expressed this way, for example. The way of difficult practice, so the esoteric one, is like walking a steep path. The way of easy practice is like traveling an ocean route by boat. This difficult path should not be pursued by those with weak legs or failing vision, i.e. should not be pursued by ordinary people, as he says later. Simply by boarding the boat once, one can reach the other shore. But these days, we are such that our eyes of these days, again, but these days, in this historical moment, we all are such that our eyes of wisdom work improperly. We have been degenerated by the times we live in, and our legs of practice are broken. In the end, it is clear that the steep way of the path to self-perfection, the way of difficult practice, will only frustrate our hopes. So there's a little, so even amongst those who would consider themselves worthy of sort of the path of self-perfection, the esoteric one, there's an additional point here that Honen is making that like we all, including the better ones, so to speak, have been so degenerated by the times, we are also incapable of sort of that perfection of wisdom that that difficult path prescribes. And so, to, as he says, then, so then to mix up these two would be to no effect. And so if, if I can use the metaphor for a, sec, a second, so if like, um, if the esoteric practice is like climbing up a steep mountain little by little by little by little, and and if the sort of the Nembutsu is just like, you know, getting in a ferry boat and having like the boat take you across the sea. So they're they're so distinct that you can't like use elements between the two in the same way that you can't hike across the ocean in the same way that you can hike up a mountain. Similarly, you can't take a boat up a mountain. So there's a sort of absurdity there. The idea is that they are such fundamentally different ways of doing things. You can't mix them be precisely because it just doesn't make any sense. It just, it wouldn't do anything. There is, as he says, literally no power to succeed in those, in those routes. So with that, I'm gonna stop the share for a moment. Okay, so that's um, a brief overview, <laughs> brief, brief <laughs> overview of the, the Genpei War and um, Pure Land Buddhism, especially as it derived from esoteric Buddhism. Um, I'm gonna take a quick break, drink some tea, and then I will be back with your second video for this week, specifically on the, the Tales of the Heike or the Heike Monogatari. So I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> 